The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So today, I'll start, as I often do, with, with a Pali, Pali verse, um, which can bewilder and perhaps intrigue, but we also have some uh, Pali class starting, a Pali class that's being run here on Saturday. So the teacher for the Pali class is here today. So if you're interested in Pali, there are, there are Pali classes on a Saturday afternoon. And it's very good because Pali was the language, very close to the language of the Buddha. And so it's a very direct way to get, uh, get in touch with the teachings. So this one, this gata, is, is, goes as follows. And it's from the Dhammapada, from the Tanha Wanga, which uh, means craving or means wanting chapter. Ananti boga du medhang no cha para gavesino boga tan hayam du medho hanti anyeva atanang. And what that means in English, <laughs> sorry, sorry. what that means in English is wealth destroys those who lack in wisdom, but not those who seek the beyond. Craving wealth. Those lacking wisdom destroy themselves and others uh, as well. So that's uh, all about um, people recognize what's focusing on here. Focusing on. Virtue. Hmm? Virtue? Ah, greed. Greed. Did somebody say greed? Yes, uh, maybe I, I, I've already given him, <laughs> talked about it a bit before. It's greed, really. Tan higher. Tanhaya, of course, is craving in, in English, in Pali, it's uh, um, a tanhaya, and that's also wanting. And it's the source for, for, a, for the defilements that we, part of the source for the defilements we experience. So those that lack wisdom, you know, then they don't know what wealth is for, why they're amassing wealth. And of course, what is the purpose of, of wealth? What would you say was the purpose of wealth? Materialism, I heard. Yeah, purchasing. It's really the aim, isn't it, is to make happiness, to bring happiness, either to oneself or others, or both if possible. And if people don't remember that, then, you know, this is lacking in wisdom. If they're just amassing it from the sense of greed, you know, wanting more and more, to make themselves more secure, to make themselves more powerful, give themselves more status, whatever it be, then that is not coming from wisdom. And it won't bring them that happiness. Because one who doesn't understand the purpose of wealth is not going to find the happiness. They'll find it an empty, they'll have a very comfortable existence, but not necessarily a happy and satisfied existence. And of course the Buddha goes on to say, but those who seek the beyond, what's the beyond? Anybody got any ideas? The beyond? Nibbana. Nibbana, actually, that's it. Yeah, not rebirth. Well, that happens pretty automatically. Nibbana is, uh, is more difficult. So it's really pointing to those who practice a spiritual path, who have an idea of the core values, human values, that lead to happiness. Of course, we all need a certain degree of uh, wealth in the sense to to uh, fulfill the necessities of life, don't we? Monks and nuns, we have robes, we have clothes, <coughs> we need food, we need shelter, and we need medicines in time of sickness. This is the same for everybody. But we know that this is um, part, this is not, uh, this is uh, necessary, but it's not the, an end in itself. Wealth is not an end in itself. Having these necessities of life, is not the end in itself. This is a purpose. The purpose is to develop the spiritual qualities, to develop those good values in the heart, to reduce the negative qualities that we all we have. And if possible, to go beyond. This is seeking the beyond. So this is seeking Nibbana. So someone who's intent on finding the real happiness, which is inner happiness. Wealth, all about outer happiness. And yes, we, that can be very enjoyable and can be comfortable, but in the end, somebody who can have as much, much of the sense pleasures as they like, they can see, hear, smell, taste, and touch whatever they wish, 
they get very tired with it. And you often hear, well, I've heard of wealthy people, I'm sure it's not true of all of them, get very bored and depressed. Because then, of course, the natural, natural wisdom that arises is, is that all there is? <laughs> you know, this uh, pursuit of uh, wealth, pursuit of comfort, pursuit of these sense pleasures. And of course, that was a song from the 1950s. Do many people remember that one? Is that all there is? And it's a very, in a way, there's a wisdom that goes with that because that's a natural outcome of materialism is actually eventually to say, is that all there is? It's not satisfying. It's not giving me what I want, which is happiness. But happiness requires, what does happiness hinge on? Having a purpose and a meaning to life. And just consuming, just enjoying, you know, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touch, touching is not enough meaning for life, actually, for, for most people. It's, uh, it ends up with a feeling of emptiness. Yep, movie's over, the video's over, this is over, <laughs> food's over. You know, all this, it's always finishing. And so it's not really satisfying. So craving wealth, those lacking wisdom, destroy themselves as well as others. The amassing of wealth usually, often, not always, comes at other people's expenses, doesn't it? <laughs> we're, we're more aware of that these days because there's competition that often comes with a sense of aggression. This is the negative aspect of, um, we say, ill will or uh, often called hatred in Buddhism. That comes up and in the process we may be prepared to uh, harm others of course, you know, from Buddhist perspective, when we harm others, we're harming ourselves too, because we'll get the karmic consequences of it. So one needs wealth in order, uh, one needs wisdom in order to enjoy wealth. And the story that uh, the Buddha told with this uh, verse, uh, he, yes, it's mentioned anyway, it's in the commentaries, was about a man who, who lacked wisdom, he was very, very wealthy, and uh, one day uh, the Buddha was at his monastery, the Jetavana, his main monastery, and uh, this, the king came to see him, King Pasenati came to see him in the afternoon, sort of the wrong time in a sense, you know, it wasn't the time for the meal or anything like that. And uh, the Buddha asked him, why have you come at this time? And he said, well, he said, I've just been to, um, I suppose you say confiscate, anyway, he, he, he took the wealth of took the property of a, a millionaire, a wealthy man who had just died. He had no children. And uh, he said, the king said, he just amassed this wealth and he, he couldn't enjoy it. He, he didn't even spend it on himself. He was incredibly frugal with himself and he just built more and more wealth. And uh, in the end, he had no heir. So the king, the government, was the uh, recipient. So he's taking all this wealth back to the treasury. And then the Buddha said, ah, he said, this, this man, he, uh, the, per the reason he uh, amassed this wealth, the reason that he came to be a wealthy person, was he gave to what we call a Pacheka Buddha in the past. This is someone who realizes enlightenment but doesn't teach, it doesn't become a, like a, a very, um, uh, a teaching that reaches many people. I'm sure a Pacheka Buddha teaches in a sense, but more very, very small group of people. And that was the reason that he amassed this wealth. And then the Buddha said, and the reason he couldn't enjoy the wealth was because after he had given it, he'd, he'd asked his wife actually to make a meal for, the, uh, for this uh, Pacheka Buddha. And um, she, she made the meal and and uh, he saw it. Oh my goodness! It's so much she's giving to him. And afterwards, she thought, "Oh, he thought, oh, if she hadn't given it to him, she could have given it to the servants, and they could have done more work, and <laughs> and uh, so on." You know. So he regretted it. And so the Buddha said, "This was the cause for him in that life not being able to enjoy wealth." And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Because you see this: there are wealthy people in the world who can't enjoy their wealth. I assume it's because their wealth is their security, and if they if, they, it, if it diminishes in any sense, they feel less secure. So that's very interesting, this one, this gata I like a lot. And it says a lot about our present situation, you know, that we find the world in. And the reason the talk, the title of this talk is, uh, I also did this talk, um, similar talk, not really a talk actually, for the teens group, and it is 
Greed is good. Greed is good. Is that true? It's a bit confronting, isn't it? <laughs> Greed is good. Who could say that? So the reason for this is that, uh, you know, particularly the, the, the uh, origin for this talk was really seeing a lot of these, uh, seeing things about climate change. Have, uh, have you seen things on television, on the uh, internet about climate change? I think most people have. I saw Bhikkhu Bodhi's address to the UN uh, in uh, May for the Vesak. He gave an, an address and it was on climate change. And he was, he was using the image of the houses on fire, the houses burning. And it's what is it burning with? Any ideas? Greed, hatred and delusion. <laughs> but pretty much with greed actually. So this Seeing these things about climate change, and particularly, uh, as I say, uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi, but also uh, you've probably seen more well known than Bhikkhu Bodhi is Greta Thunberg. Did you see? Have you seen her in the news? Nobody not heard of her. Some people not heard of her. Wow. She's been in the U.S. She she too addressed the U.N. actually recently. Uh, I think about a month or so ago now. And I was amazed by it because I saw it and I thought, my goodness, she's so angry. I thought, well, I hope this works. But, you know, from a Buddhist perspective, you see somebody angry and think, this is not a, not a good way to get your message across. The young, the young girl, yes. Have you seen? She's not really that young when you think of it. She's 16, so she's not young. She's almost a young woman, actually. But she was so angry and every sentence of that, she had a half a dozen sentences and she'd say, how dare you? She's saying, dot, 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 how dare you? And dot, 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 how dare you? And then she used a very strong line. She said, we will not forgive you. Wow. You know, it was really, when you saw the talk, you thought, wow, I hope it has a positive outcome. When I saw it, I thought, wow, she's really upset and uh, concerned. I think that was the, the purpose of, of that anger, was to show how serious the situation was. But of course, you know, when we're angry and upset, we can't, as it were, get the message across in the clearest, the best way. She did quite a good job because if you think when you get angry and upset, it's very hard to hold it together. And she did. <laughs> she managed. I thought, wow. So this uh, talk really is, uh, um, is an investigation into is, gre is, uh, gre is greed good? Is greed good? And... Uh, it's something we can all look into because really the only way, you know, you can hear it from the Buddha, you can hear it from me, no, greed's terrible, you know, dot, 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 dot. But unless we look into our own lives and see that greed's not giving us what we want, then we won't make changes in our life. And um, really, you know, if we are going to make changes for the environment, for uh, about climate change, etc., we have to start at home. This is where we can do something. Because I don't know about you, but many people probably feel, well, what can I do <laughs> about climate change? It's a global phenomenon for sure. But of course, you know, where, this, where we can do something is start at home, and that's the best place to start. It's like the five precepts, you know. I, I call them, you know, a contribution to world peace. Yes, we're only keeping them here and in Melbourne or, you know, in your family or whatever. But these five precepts are like um, a way to promote peace in the family, peace in the community we live in. And when we extend that, when that develops, more people keep, keep the five precepts or some moral code, ethical code, then more, more peace will occur in the world. Because we have to start working on the origins of these things, isn't it? What's the, or the origin of these things, of course, is within the mind, within the mind. Even though we're having with climate change, Perth just had, I think, 40 or something yesterday. It's coming this way, <laughs> you know, in November. So we, we have to, we can contribute by working on ourselves. And in the process, we can bring happiness to ourselves, a greater sense of purpose and meaning to our lives too. Because we're not only doing the practice for ourselves, others benefit from it. Sometimes people say a spiritual practice is selfish, but when you think of it, think of the Buddha for instance, was he selfish? <laughs> 
He gave so much to the world, actually. He gave so much to the world. And maybe you think, well, I'm not a Buddha. I can't give talks or I can't, you know, um, perform miracles or, you know, impress people, whatever it is. But by our example, and if we become a, a happier, more peaceful, more wise person, that's, that is a message for other people. I always say to people, you know, it's not the words that count, though sometimes the words can be helpful. It's the example, isn't it, really? That really is much more powerful than the words. So, of course, the investigation into greed is um, really, does, that, does it make us happy? Does it give meaning and does it give purpose to our lives or not? And the background to this talk, you might wonder, I did, I didn't know actually, who said greed is good? Anybody know? Yeah, you're exactly right. I didn't know that. I, I, I found it on the internet actually and uh, I saw the, the video clip from the movie. It's from a movie called Wall Street and the character, the, one of the characters in it is called Gordon Gecko. unfortunate name in Australia. <laughs> Gecko's, Gecko in Australia is a lizard. <laughs> so anyway, well maybe it's pur on purpose. He's not a, he's it's sort of like an um, uh, evil character in the movie because he's just so ruthless and this is what I gather from the plot. And, uh, you know, just willing to do anything to anyone in order to uh, make more wealth. And he's like a, um, a stockbroker, he's a financier, and it was at the time of all this inside trading in the 19, 1980s, 1985-1986, and uh, junk bonds as they called it. But this is what he said, and in actual fact he was using words that a real life person, uh, a financier, had said too, some of the words here. And he says, the point is, ladies and gentlemen, that greed, for lack of a better word, I think this is interesting, is good. <laughs> greed is right. Greed works. Amazing, isn't it? Greed clarifies, cuts through, and captures the essence of the evolutionary spirit. Greed in all of its forms, greed for life, greed for money, for love, greed for knowledge, has marked the upsurge of mankind. Wow. Amazing, isn't it? <laughs> when you see the movie, it sounds, you know, sounds quite uh, convincing. You know, in the movie, they're clapping and so forth. But I think anyone who reads this, uh, reads it, I think it's good because it really, you know, when you hear that, is greed good? You know, uh, is greed good? What is it good for? He doesn't actually say. It's like a lot of advertising. They don't actually tell you what it's good for. You know, and what the Buddha would say it's good for. What do you think the Buddha would say greed is good for? Suffering. Suffering yep. Competition, conflict, um, jealousy, envy. They're pretty good for that. <laughs> but he's probably thinking of it in good for financial terms, you know, the returns. And maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You know, I, I have my doubts about that because uh, often... <laughs> greedy people rip other people off, they take advantage of them, exploit them and while you can do that for a short time I doubt that it's really sustainable, you can't keep the business going and people who have been exploited or ripped off will they come back to, to uh, buy things from you, to be involved in business with you, will they trust you? No way! So it's a very a very short-sighted approach actually for business if they think greed is good. One of the uh, nice definitions for business that I saw, <laughs> because I like tea, is from the founder of Dilma and he says that business is a matter of human service. Business is a matter of human service. And that is a very high standard, isn't it, for looking at business. But if, if you have that attitude, are you going to rip people off? Are you going to take advantage? Are they going to be? You're going to, you know, exploit them? No. You want to provide the best possible service, and then, of course, people will be in, may be interested in coming back again, you know, being involved with you. And I think that that is a much that's a much uh, uh, better standard, a much more meaningful way to see business 
because if you see business as just gratifying your greed, just getting as much as you can, <laughs> then that's not enough. But if you think you're doing something that benefits others, that is, that's quite a noble thing, actually, and can give you purpose and meaning. And he says, greed is right, right for I'm not sure what. <laughs> is right in the sense of, uh, uh, what do you say? Might is right, that idea, I think, because a greedy person may have some power and they have, may have might in that sense. And greed works, and I say, maybe it works for the short term, but it's not really sustainable. Because when it's uh, often, as I said before, when we're greedy, we have, we're aggressive, we're competitive, we're getting our way, and it's based on this sense of me and I, what I want, what I don't want, what I like, all these things. And I may show you a video later that captures that very well. So he says, and he says, greed clarifies. Of course it does, because you see it with greed, hatred, it's the same too, in the same way. If we're greedy, we're really focused on a goal. We're focused on something we want to get. And that can give a sense of clarity to us. But it doesn't bring a sort of happiness to, to us, because whatever we're greedy for, whatever we want, we don't have it now. So we we are feeling this lack and we want to get it and the promise is when I get it I'll be happy <laughs> I'll be happy and satisfied but of course greed doesn't work like that as soon as and uh, craving doesn't work like that wanting doesn't work like that as soon as you get that then we're on to the next one and actually when we often get what we want this is another song we, 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 it turns out to be uh, something quite different from what we expected or sometimes it's a bit disappointing um, that it's not quite what we want. The song is when you get what you want you don't want it anymore and that, that's quite a wise saying too actually. And the person who sang that? Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> wow, what an happy life. <laughs> I thought, gee, good example. And greed cuts through and captures, uh, greed cuts through, yes, it cuts through if you're really greedy and uh, you've got a lot of determination, yeah, you can get what you want. Uh, and at, as I say, at the expense, cuts through is a good, good word actually, because it's sort of, you know, just, who cares <laughs> what other people think, what are other people's, uh, how they're affected by my actions. And captures the evolutionary, uh, the essence of the evolutionary spirit. I think the essence of the evolutionary spirit is probably more like survival, right, really. And you could say survival may be close to greed, I don't know, actually. And so greed in all its forms, greed for life, greed for money, greed for love, greed for knowledge, has marked the upsurge of mankind. I don't know about that. It's often, it's not often led to wars. It's often led to um, conflicts between people. You know, conflict, uh, conflicts, especially this greed for love, if they're competing for the same person, people will do almost anything. So all these things, we can see that there is a uh, really <coughs> negative aspect to it that the Buddha, the Buddha looked at in uh, quite a bit of detail, actually. As someone said, you know, and I've seen it, actually. I've, saw, I've seen a few videos on greed, and they're quite good. But somebody said to me, the Buddha's critique on greed is the best, the deepest. And I think it's exactly right, exactly right. So, do people know what greed is? What's the definition of greed? Insatiable desire. That's, that's perfect, yeah, that's insatiable desire. Yes, yes, it is. The definition... The um, dic dictionary definition is a selfish or excessive desire for more than is needed or deserved. That's interesting. Uh, especially of money, wealth, food or other possessions. So this, and we see that these days, of course, one of the big culprits in the climate change, environmental problems. Anybody got any idea of what one of the big culprits? You hear about it quite a bit. And we are experiencing it here in Australia quite a bit too. Hmm? Logging. logging, yeah. It's an example of logging, actually, because... Beef. Beef. You know, I, that's an, another example of this... Hmm? 
mining. Yes, that's part of it too, but it's the corporate greed, you know, the, the sort of companies. It's not greed, you know, it's not a personal greed. It's not an individual, is it? If it's a bank or, or whatever, it's not an individual. But the, the repercussions of corporate greed are huge because it impacts on the environment and lots of people as well. So the banks, their employees and so on. Uh, that's in the news at the moment, you know, and this corporate greed which informs the whole of the, they call it the culture, the environment or that business. When you're, when you're end, when the be all and end all is money, is to make money, to uh, grow all the time, then everyone else is expendable, aren't they? They're just tools for achieving that end. They're not human beings. It's no longer human beings. It's just they are, me are means to that end, and that's the the end of uh, that's the aim, as I said, of corporate greed. And rather than you know, and you do see some examples. You hear of them. I don't know uh, of, of corporations that are trying to create uh, environments, cultures that are human friendly, that uh, encourage their workers to to be happier, to be at ease. To, and, and in that sense, be able to work at their, uh, at their maximum capacity in a way. You could say that's still greed, <laughs> but, but at least it's a, it's a more people-oriented way of approaching business. So, so I just thought I'd give, as, as I didn't last week, uh, someone complained actually. They said, this clock, yes, they said there was no Nazarudin story. <laughs> And I said, well, there was, but I didn't get to it. <laughs> there was, but it was much later I didn't get to it. So this is another Nazrudin story, which is a lovely, I quite like, actually. It's quite funny. And uh, Nazrudin, once he went to them, this Nazrudin is a Sufi holy man, so-called holy man, I think. It's hard to tell whether he's very wise or a, a comedian, actually. But um, uh, he once went to the market in his uh, village, and he saw they were selling these parrots. They had these parrots. And the, the parrots, the special thing about the parrots is they could talk. They could talk. And he was really, he was amazed because people were fi paying 500 coins for a talking parrot. And he thought, wow, this is, this is wonderful. This is amazing. He thought, how can I cash in on it? <laughs> this is great, isn't it? <laughs> so he went home and he thought, hmm, what to do, what to do? Ah, next week when he went to the market, he took his hen, he took a hen with him, and he put a sign up, 500 coins for my hen. They, nobody was interested at all. They wouldn't even offer him 50 coins. So he got very angry, upset, and he said to them, what is, this is much bigger than the parrots. One thing, it's much bigger. It's about four or five times bigger than the parrots. And he has beautiful thoughts, and he doesn't annoy you with his chatter. <laughs> <laughs> Still got no takers. <laughs> but that doesn't that remind you of uh, business and merchandising, you know, and advertising. You, you, you're really, you know, the, the fact that he's much bigger and that he's uh, got these beautiful thoughts that nobody else can be aware of. <laughs> and he doesn't annoy you with the chatter. But the Buddha's definition of greed is, a, is, a, is somewhat different, a little bit different from that. It's not really... Uh, greed, as we have it in uh, the English language or in most languages, is like excess, and that's true, and that is true in Buddhism too. But it's 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 uh, greed is sort of there's many words for it because the Buddha is dealing with the mind. You see this when you try and translate Pali into English. There are so many words for mental. Um, experiences, thoughts, emotions and so on, which we don't have in English because uh, our focus is not so much on the nature of the mind but of course a teaching, a spiritual teaching that focuses on the mind has, show, has a lot of detail for what's going on in our minds. And so the Buddha talks about loba, this is greed, but he also talks about raga, sometimes translated in English as lust, but it's such an old-fashioned word, lust, it uh, doesn't do much for me. Very strong craving, it can be craving for anything really. Even though we use the word lust primarily in English for sexual things, it can be craving for anything, but it's a very strong craving or wanting. 
And then uh, the other one is that he has his tanha, I mentioned, wanting and craving. And he says, this is the source of our unhappiness in life. This is the source of unsatisfactoriness in our life. Because when we want something we don't have, it's already, you know, a sense of lack. We're already feeling uns unsatisfied. We may get it, we may not get it. So the Buddha, is, when he's looking at uh, the nature of life and his teachings, this is the second noble truth, is really pinpointing this as a key culprit, actually. And actually, when you say, think of it like in those terms, the Buddha talked about samsara, the, fa the fact that we are born again and again. One of the key things that drives us through samsara is this loba, this greed, this wanting to experience the senses, uh, the sense pleasures again and again. Um, so this is what keeps us here in samsara, more so than uh, the other three roots, the other two roots, sorry. The Buddha saw that, uh, that um, the three things that keep us going in samsara negative things are greed, hatred and delusion. And as I just said, greed keeps us buying into wanting. We want to be reborn, that's why we're reborn, that's it. And because we think, you know, there's happiness there in those things, those things outside ourselves, those things that we're used to. And we see it, you know, you know our favourite foods, our favourite uh, Mm, television shows or whatever it is, visual shows, favourite music, favourite this and that. These things will uh, incline the mind to want them again in the future, to be reborn, to experience them. And one of the sufferings of old age is that our senses are dimming, our experience of the outside world is fading. We can't see so well, we can't hear so well, maybe can't even taste so well, smell, and the body becomes quite painful perhaps. So the whole of that uh, seeking happiness in the outside world, when we become old, becomes problematic. And we be people can become depressed because that's their world. They haven't developed the happiness inside themselves. They haven't looked for the source of happiness, which is in the mind. But the Buddha, he goes into a lot more uh, detail with greed in the sense that greed is really any degree of um, wanting or attraction towards something, something that when we when we see it, they say subanimita, when we see it as something uh, beautiful or something positive, something we want to go for, then uh, there will be this attraction and this there can be this wanting, because the process of uh, you all know it, the paticca samuppada, this is the um, dependent origination, it's called. Part of that is that because we have senses, you know, hearing, sight, eyes, ears, nose and tongue, etc., body, and so forth, then we will have contact. We will experience uh, contact through those senses. We'll see things, we'll hear things, smell things, taste things, and so on, and think things. That's another sense in Buddhism. And because of that, there will be a feeling that goes based on that, which will either be pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. We don't pay much attention to neutral. And then from that, then we craving or this wanting comes up. If, it, if it's a pleasant feeling, usually, wow, I want more of it, must get more of it. <laughs> and then the, uh, from that, then we have the clinging, as we call upadana. And this is that quality of the mind that really sticks to it and thinks, yes, yes, this is the source of happiness for me. So this is... Uh, the process that we see arising when, uh, with greed. Greed is tanhaya, it's like the, the tanha, the wanting, and it comes up in that way. And it's the same with, so the Buddha is saying that this is from the very slightest form of wanting to the most extreme, you know, wanting, which is a real greed, you know, incredible greed. So it's not just it's not not just excess as such. It's just that inclination of the mind. And why is that the case? Why why would he think this is not a good thing? Because you, know, you see it. We can see it in our own experience. When we feel greedy, how does it feel? When you feel like you've got to have this whatever it is, this iPhone. You've got to have this relationship. You've got to have this job. What does it feel like? Is it uh, pleasant, a pleasant feeling? 
Not really. You, I'll, I'll have to answer. <laughs> Nobody else is. So, but uh, it's actually a feeling of lack and the feeling of fear that we may not get what we want. We may not, you know. Uh, so, this um, this is, is this leading to this unsatisfactoriness in our lives. So, this is part of the the Buddha's definition of greed is all the sh shades of it. And the same with hate, all the shades of it. And one of the, um, and I might show soon actually a, a video because I can see people getting a little bit tired. So something like a change will be a good idea. So we have greed, hatred and delusion. These are the three negative things that Buddha pointed to. But delusion is what makes greed and hatred work. Because it makes us believe what we are greedy for, what we want is worth wanting in, 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 in the first place. Wanting in the sense that we ignore the fact that it's impermanent, we, we ignore the fact that it's, yeah, it's a bit of happiness but it's not a very satisfying happiness. And the, one of the most important aspects of delusion, and also beauty is one another aspect of delusion. We see something we want as beautiful, but the, one of the most important things is it, it's me wanting. <laughs> I want this. I want this relationship. I want this job. I want this I, iPad. So this is what is driving a lot of the uh, greed, a lot of the delusion, a lot of the hate as well. You know, people who are very greedy and successful at it can become quite powerful. They can have quite a, a lot of uh, say because they have a lot of money. Uh, and uh, they can have quite a high place status in their society. So it's this sense of I that really um, can... Oh, is this from... Is it a message? <laughs> <laughs> so this is something that really drives uh, greed, hatred and delusion. I should say, uh, and maybe we'll, we will uh, have the video in a second, I'll just mention the... Christian saying here too, because it ties in very well with the Buddhist one. Have you heard that uh, um, that saying about money is the root of all evil? Have you heard that? Somebody said to me this week actually, because we were talking about greed, <laughs> so it's quite interesting, she said, no, no, that's not the correct saying. Money is not the root of all evil. Do you know what the correct saying is? I checked it on the internet, I agree. It's the love of money. Very good. Very good. That's exactly it. So what is the love of money? Greed. Yeah, it comes back to it. So, you know, Buddhism and Christianity are agreeing that greed probably not a good thing. <laughs> not, not, for, not for developing the spiritual life. So now we can just see uh, that video, which I, I really like this one, actually. There's many that are... So I hope the quality is okay. And it's called... The, what's it called? The most selfish one-letter word. And it's by a, um, he's like a Hindu monk. He's in, I think he's in the Krishna tradition, but he's a motivational speaker who travels the world. And a lot of things he says, very, very good, very wise and common sense. So let's have, this is Gopal, uh, Gao Gopal Das. Das. So, yeah. Have many of you seen him before? No? Oh, well, he's really, he's really good, actually. He's very, very clear. Can you see that now? It's very dramatic. What is the most selfish one-lettered word? I, isn't it? Everything revolves around I. iPhone. <laughs> iPad. iPod. And the man says, I paid. <laughs> <laughs> what do you do? Everything revolves around the I. And what does I stand for? I stands for expectations. I should be treated like this. I should be loved like this. I should be dealt with like this. I should be respected like this. I should be given these many marks. I should not be given this. You're all leading a life of super high expectations. Everything revolves around my opinions, my desires, my likes, my dislikes, I love this, I want this, I don't want this. I, 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 I. You think life will be a very happy life when it revolves around I? From our childhood we have grown up like this. We've only learned to take. 
and everyone has to fulfill my expectations. Everything has to be up to my expectations. One boy comes to a mother and says, Mama, I love you. Five-year-old mother said, I love you too, bitter. The guy grew up to be 16. Goes to the mother, Mama, I love you. Kitna paisa chahiye bol. He grows up to be 25. Mama, I love you. Kaun hai? Kidar rehti hai? Bata do. Hum arrange kar denge, bata do. He turns to be 40. Mama, I love you. Bola tha na shadi mat kar usse. He turns 60. 60. Mama, I love you. I will not sign on any paper. You go. My mother knows. Mother knows. It's all about my expectations, how it goes. And marriage? You think only children, girlfriends, boyfriends? What's marriage? Such expectations of treatment, each other's expectations. God. And you think religion is spared? If youngsters are not spared, girlfriends and boyfriends are not spared, married people are not spared, you think religious men and religious people coming to a temple are spared from the eye? I don't think so. Therefore, when people come to God, people come to a temple also, they're only asking, give me what I want. No one comes to say, I love you, I want to, I want to give you. When the President of the United States, John F. Kennedy, came up to his stage for his first presidential speech, his voice rumbled into the public address system when he said, Ask not what the country can do for you. Ask what you can do for the country. And so we are saying, Ask not what God can do for you. Ask what you can do for God. But no one asks that. Because the eye is so big, my expectations, my desires, my things are so powerful that even when I come to a temple and ring a bell, all I'm doing is asking. The more we lead a life of I, our I will always be frustrated. Because people don't exist in this world to just fulfill your expectations. Therefore, ladies and gentlemen, the most selfish one-lettered word is I, which stands for expectations, and therefore avoid this word. How do you avoid this word? Be realistic in your expectations. problem but Understand that not everyone will fulfill your expectation. And secondly, avoid this word I by trying to serve others. You know why? Because when you want to be served, you're dependent on people. They may not serve you. When you want to serve, who can stop it? When you want respect, people may not respect you. But when you want to give respect, who can stop you? When you want to be loved, you may not be loved. But when you want to give love, who can stop you? When you want in charity, people may not give you in charity. But when you want to give charity, who can stop you? And therefore, learn to begin your journey from I to you. The more you want for yourself, you'll remain frustrated. The more you want to give, you'll remain happy. I hope that. That got the message across. That's it. How the I, you know, makes it all this happen. The greed happen. How the hate happens, and how it's a big part of our delusion of how things are. We think there's a permanent me, I inside, that needs all these things, has to have all these things. That's greed, and we have to perhaps get rid of people who are going to frustrate that those aims. But it's very important to think what we can do to reduce or eliminate greed. And basically all of the Buddha's teachings are aimed at that. It's very much what I spoke about last week, about how do we protect ourselves and others. And we protect ourselves and others by uh, reducing these negative qualities in our lives. We project, protect others and ourselves by giving, as he mentioned, by keeping an ethical standard we call the sila in Buddhism and by developing our minds, cultivating our minds. What do we develop and cultivate? Positive values, good values. And we uh, reduce and, if possibly, eliminate the negative qualities in the mind. The good news is, when we develop positive qualities, when we 
develop them and maintain them, this is what the Buddha is calling samawayama, it overcomes, it avoids negative qualities and it avoids, it also means we don't have to let go of them because it replaces them, it gives the focuses these positive qualities. So this is, uh, and the other aspect that uh, the Buddha was, that helps us to to overcome these uh, negative aspects is wisdom, understanding how things re truly are. And this of course comes when we develop our meditation uh, and the mind becomes peaceful, still powerful and then can see into things. And one of the big things that uh, breaks up greed and uh, is seeing uh, anicca, uh, impermanence, that nothing lasts. You know when we want something, we don't, th we don't think of it you know, being broken and put in the bin, do we? If you're thinking of your late, uh, wanting an iPhone, you don't think of it when it's going to be broken down and in the bin. But when you realize that everything is of that nature, it enables us to let go much, much more. And uh, so this is a very, very useful thing with greed. But we basically want to develop qualities. The Buddha said, in order to let go of greed, we should develop the opposite. So, so to see the unattractive quality in things that we're greedy for, or the disadvantages, or the dangers, sometimes he called it, in those things. That way we can let go of it and give balance to the mind. But a very good way I th uh, that includes, uh, that is a counter or an opposite to greed, is to develop contentment in our lives. And I was... I had here as well, uh, to develop that sense of being happy to be here. That's contentment. Because the uh, greed, it always gives us a lot of work. We've got to get something. We've got to do something in order to be happy. But contentment says, it's not perfect, but I'm happy to be here. This body's not perfect. The mind's not perfect, but I'm happy to be here. I haven't got everything I want, but it doesn't matter. I'm happy to be here. So this is is a is a uh, is an opposite, is a counteracting of the of greed. And same, same with um, thankfulness does pretty much the same too. When we are aware of the things in our life that we're thankful for, the people we're uh, uh, thankful for, the you know, as I say, the things that we've got, then that leads to a sense of contentment with, oh yes, great that I've got this, I have got a very good relation, good family, I've got good job, people I work with are good, and just to appreciate what we have. Because this sense of greed, it tells us what's missing, what we need, what, what could be improved on, you know, to be happy, to be fulfilled, to be satisfied. But of course that's a con, because really we have a lot already that we may not appreciate, not may not be thankful for. And as soon as we develop that thankfulness, that contentment, then there's happiness. As Ajahn Brahm's saying, a saying that I like a lot is, uh, happiness or contentment is not having what you like, not having what you like, it's liking what you have. Pretty simple, isn't it? But it's just turning it around, and uh, in that way we can counteract greed, bring more happiness to our lives, achieve what we're actually looking for, inner happiness. And of course the opposite for hate was metta, you know, particularly metta. Any form of kindness uh, uh, helps with, uh, with uh, hate, to diminish hate, reduce hate. And delusion, developing uh, wisdom, developing wise perceptions, understanding life, which we do bit by bit, don't we? Actually another very important way of counteracting greed, what's the most? He mentioned it. Yep, exactly. Dana or giving. Giving is, is, is the big, a very, very big thing. As, and as I say to people, often giving can bring us more <laughs> happiness than getting. You know, if we can give so something to someone that you know it makes a big difference, then, you know, that can bring real happiness and satisfaction. And I say to people, that I suspect is why these billionaires in America want to have this idea of giving away as much of their money as possible. They set up these foundations to, to help people in, say, well, I think Bill Gates Foundation helps people in Africa all around the world. And uh, so the, why would they do that? They can have anything they want. I mean, you're a billionaire, it's probably, you know, all the sights, smells, tastes, touches, you, you, you can have everything. You can have the most beautiful houses, the mansions, the clothes, 
you know, a thousand pairs of shoes, whatever it is, <laughs> uh, and all the medicine, the medical attention, you can have that, uh, and so on. And so for them, you know, th that's, they can do that. But that may be not as satisfying as the work that they are doing for others. And that's how they will be remembered too. And they'll feel good about that. Because when we do think of others, it really gives us an inner happiness, an inner happiness uh, from that good action. So I'd like to encourage all of us today, I've got to finish now, to develop, um, to recognize greed and recognize uh, how we feel when we're greedy and, and therefore to look at abandoning and letting go of it and finding real happiness inside. And in the same, and in the process, helping the environment and helping with climate change. Because if we start to reduce our greed within us, this will have an effect. You say, well, we can say, well, it's only me. We've got to start somewhere, don't we, for it to become a global phenomena. And when you think of it, someone like this Greta Thunberg, only one schoolgirl, a schoolgirl school in Sweden, I think, Sweden. And look what effect she's had. She's really raised the awareness about climate change, which sounds fairly urgent for, for all of us as a species, you know. So, so I encourage you to uh, look at greed and ask yourself, is greed good? <laughs> is that true? And uh, then take the necessary action because when we do uh, take the necessary action, then we can find happiness, we can find freedom from, from greed. As I mentioned, the Buddha's teaching is all about freedom. He said, my teaching has one taste, like the taste that the ocean has salt, t salty taste. My teaching has the taste of freedom. So this is what's being offered, freedom for the mind, freedom from attachments and addictions that don't bring us what we are hoping for, happiness, satisfaction, meaning and purpose. So thank you very much for this morning, and if there are any questions, we may have a little time for uh, questions. It's sort of been a wide-ranging talk, but the theme was greed. <laughs> I hope to, I'm planning to do for the teen and teens group, uh, hate and delusion as well. So that, that's quite interesting for me, very useful actually. Thank you. Any questions there? Hmm. Helen. Oh, hello, Helen. Good morning. Nice to see you. It's, n it's not really a question, it's a comment. Oh, uh, great, great. <laughs> um, I agree with you. There's not much that can be said for the banks at the moment. I mean, it, they're just so greedy, we've mm. seen. But some of them, I believe, have refused to fund um, coal mining and oh, in, in the... It, with the belief of climate change, are actually arguing against the government on that still. We've seen it this week. That's good news, isn't it, when uh, when they take a position like that? You know, very good. Um, but then my question is, uh, we all understand the, the negative connotations of greed, mm -hmm. but desire mm -hmm. is a much more subtle term. Yes. But yes. I think good that is as powerful sometimes as greed. Can you comment, Ban? Comment, yes, yes. Yes, that's true. You know, there, that's when uh, Gordon Gecko says, for lack of a better word, he uses greed. That's actually a very true comment because greed is just a very broad term. But in, in uh, the Buddha's teaching, because I said it's a teaching about the mind, there are lots of different types of desires. You know, there is uh, tanha, we've talked about, wanting that will lead to rebirth. It's the wanting that leads to rebirth. That gets us reborn again and again. But then there's a desire, and sometimes he calls this chanda, that we want to practice a spiritual teaching, isn't it? That's a desire, isn't it? And, uh, you know, when you think that that is something for developing this happiness, for perhaps realizing nibbana, nirvana. So this is a, a, a very useful desire. But as Ajahn Chah said, all desire, even if it's a good desire, eventually have to let go of because <laughs> it will become an obstacle in the path. But we have to have that desire and when you think about it, 
we have another quality in Buddhism which is called determination and that's the ability to really stick with something and they call it aditana in Pali or adhisthana and that's really based on the sort of desire in a sense that you, you think something is worth going for and you go for it but it's coming from a wholesome angle greed creates, creates aditana too but it's a really negative <laughs> aditana it doesn't doesn't care what uh, the collateral damage that it causes in the meantime. So there is very you're right. Desire has its place in uh, Buddhism in in developing spiritual qualities. We need that desire, you know, to in order to come to the temple, yeah, in order to come to the center. You probably had a desire to come. You know, Ajahn, Ajahn Brahm would say, we conditioned, so we, we, we didn't have that much choice. You know, we were just, the conditioning is, well, I like to go, and uh, just go. But, um, so we desire does have many different uh, qualities to it, and it can be in a positive sense or a negative sense. And it all depends on the root that's, that's underlying it, where that desire is coming from. Is it coming from uh, uh, greed? you know, uh, something like a, a negative quality that's it's going to get go for something at all costs, no matter how much harm it causes? Is it coming from hate, which is pretty much related because, as I say, when we're greedy, then uh, this negative hate, this uh, um, uh, aversion comes up and we'll do anything that's required to get our aim. And, of course, delusion. If there's a lot of self in our desire, you know, uh, or you know, this this will p or be also be an unwholesome thing. That uh, so uh, it depends on the quality of that desire. But some desires are good. Thank you, Yasmin. That's a very good point. So this is chanda. Usually they say chanda as opposed to tanha. Yeah. Right. So any other comments, questions, or complaints? That's what I usually say. <laughs> wow. Usually the, the complaint is, when's this going to finish? <laughs> right, I think that's it. So we can... Good, good, good. Any online questions? No, no. Good, good. So now we can pay... Those who wish, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha and finish off.